This is Friday, June 26, 2015. We are at the Museum of World War II Boston, and this take is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morris Institute Library in partnership with Natick Pegasus in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan. We are privileged to have with us today Emerson Stamps. Welcome, Emerson. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born July the 23rd, 1923. And where were you born? In a little town in Arkansas called Tamo. It's T-A-M-O. And what community do you currently live? I currently live in Boston, Massachusetts, West Roxbury section. And that's at uh, 02132 zip code. All right. Your marital status? Uh, not married at the time my wife deceased, but I have a living girlfriend <laughs> for last year. <laughs> 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 okay. How about children? Do you have children? I have six children. Grandchildren? Oh, yes. How many? <laughs> Grandchildren is 14. Great grandchildren, one, two, three, four, five. Good for you. Yes. So nothing, nothing better than to be called grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what life in Tamo, Arkansas was like. I understand your parents were sharecroppers and your grandparents were slaves. That's right. So what was it like for you growing up? Uh, in, in Arkansas growing up, I, I guess the one word <laughs> would describe it best is fear because uh, my father and, and uh, my, my father's was, father was a slave, so he had a lot of those slave mentalities, you know. So he would rule the home by, you know, bullying everybody. I, I see it now, you know, and, and uh, I had four brothers and one sister. They're all deceased now. I'm the only one left of the family, the original family. So growing up in the Deep South during that period, did you experience these, uh, you know, segregation, oh, racism? It was beyond segregation. <laughs> You didn't even speak to them unless they spoke to you first. If you were walking down the sidewalk and the white people was coming towards you, you had to get off the sidewalk and walk on the street. So it was big. It was. I never heard anyone say that. You know, that you got to do this or you got to do that. But it was sort of like an ingrained understanding that uh, you, you had a place and. Your parents taught you you had a place, and your place was to not antagonize or even speak to white people unless they spoke to you first. Now, Emerson, did you go to school? Yes. God, I mean. Did you go to, I mean, elementary school, high school? When I was in Arkansas, I, mean, I started school when I was six years old, and I went till I was. 12, and then my, my father died, and my sister, who lived in Topeka, Kansas at the time, came down and took me back with her and my mother. There was only one left at the home at that point. And what was Topeka, Kansas like? Topeka is a progressive town. <laughs> it, it was where the Brown versus Board of Education, and uh, in Topeka, the schools was always uh, not segregated at the junior high level, but at the lower grades, it was segregated. There was black school and white school. But when you get to junior high, you, there was mixture of white and black students in the same classes and everything. It was the first integration, I guess, of the school system. And, that went on now that school Monroe is now a national museum. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
So that must, that must have been a bit of a culture shock for you, going into junior high school and you're sitting in the same room with white kids. <laughs> it was different, you know, and uh, some, of them, some of them would pick on you, you know, like one kid called me black, you know, and uh, just to, for the hell of it, he said, you black, you know. And the teacher heard him, you know, and he says, yeah, you're right, you know, say, he is black, but black doesn't mean he isn't a person and do the same respect as you. And I was just overwhelmed that this teacher had that insight and expressed it that way, you know. So he was my favorite teacher from then on. I hope there's a special place in heaven for that <laughs> yeah, teacher. I do too. <laughs> it's great. So uh, did you go to high school? Yes, I went to high school. and. With, well, here's, here's the way high school was. I was in junior high, and when the war broke out, so I volunteered and went into the Army at that point. Then after my service time in the Army, I came out and went to a trade school to get my high school diploma. Okay, let's reel it back a little bit and get, okay. get you back into school before you volunteered for the Army. Uh, okay. So this, um, while you were in school, were you made aware of events happening overseas uh, in Europe and Asia? Oh, yes, yes. We had a black principal who was very well read and was up to date on all the news. Because we didn't get newspapers, so couldn't afford them anyway. So you, uh, do you remember when Hitler invaded Poland? Yes, that was his first strike in invaded Poland. Yes. And without much of a fight, you know, <laughs> just took it over. Now, were you uh, working also? Well, I had an after school job, you know, I had to because uh, I couldn't get in, my parents didn't have any money. You know, my father was dead already. Uh, in those days, people burned wood mostly in their stove for heat. So I would uh, cut up kindling with a little fine wood to, and I'd supply that to the family. They'd give me 15 cents a week. Well, with that 15 cent, I could go to the movie and buy a bag of popcorn. A movie cost 10 cents, popcorn cost a nickel. So I worked all week to get to, to, get to go to the movies on Saturdays. All right, so you're, um, you're kind of still in school, you're working after school, the war is broken out in Europe. Uh, do you remember your family or your community starting to take part in, say, scrap drives or a anything else on the home front? No. no, not my family, no. Okay. The blacks couldn't participate in that, at least my family anyway. Do you remember the day Pearl Harbor was attacked? Oh, yes. And what was, what was happening in your world at that time? I was in school, yeah, and the news came down. And they had a special uh, assembly in the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, auditorium. And all the classes was called down, and, uh, and the principal spoke to the class and said we'd been attacked at, at Pearl Harbor, and you should be prepared. That probably mean we'll be in a war, and that's how I found out. Once uh, the United States got into the war, did uh, family or friends go into the service before you did? Oh yes. That was my inspiration to go into. The friends I knew with it, and I was, I didn't want them to outdo me. And when did you enter the service? Mm, it was in, it was 46. You have to look at my discharge papers. I'm oh, I think I, I actually took a look before the interview. According to your papers, you went in in 1943? Yes, I was through 46 when I was discharged, yes. And why the Army? Well, my buddies in school, that's where they were going to the Army. And 
I want, we want to stay together. <laughs> it's a little bit that helped because once we got inducted, we never saw each other again. <laughs> but that's, that was what it was. <laughs> and where did you enlist? I enlisted in Kansas, Topeka. Back in Topeka, okay. But I want to add to that. When you, uh, you enlist, you go up and sign up in Kansas. But I had to go back to my birth state to get inducted into the Army. So back to Arkansas. You yeah, go. go back to Arkansas. It's, it's like the old rule in the Bible, you know, that they had to go back to the homeland <laughs> where they were born to get registered. All right, so back to Arkansas you go. Yep. And where were you sent for basic? New Orleans, New Orleans, Louisiana. And the parade grounds and where we had to march and get our basic training was covered with white shrimp sh shells. So. Are we back in war again? I hope not. <laughs> that was me, sorry. This can be edited. Okay, New Orleans, parade grounds, white shrimp boats? No, uh, oh. okay, with the on. little shrimp. Oh, shrimp. Shells. Okay. Oh, yeah. shrimp shells, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. And you were walking on top of these? Oh, yes. That was, that was parade grounds. Uh-huh. Yeah, but on the other way, training, we were just on regular ground, you know. Because we, we was in a supply unit, and our training was to learn how to load cargo, learn how to tie the cargo. I spent three weeks learning the different knots and how to tie cargo down so it wouldn't shift around on the boat. And, uh, we stood, they had a circle big in this room, and everybody, and they had a rope go all the way around. And each person had a rope about that long. And an instructor would go around and tell you what, what tie we're gonna do now. Like the big one was bowling on the bite, which was the name of the, every tie had a different name. And it had a different place uh, in cargo. When you were loading cargo and when you tied down on the ship, you used this knot bowling on the bite or, uh, for to tie heavy stuff. And, and, and every one of them had a different name. I don't remember all of them now. <laughs> but for I'm six, sure there were a lot of them. <laughs> yes, there was. There was. But it worked. You know, they, we, you know, we used these Iron ships, you know, they was steel ships and they had anchor pins in them and the cargo was tied down to that so it wouldn't shift around when it's going overseas. So Emerson, you're learning um, to tie knots, load cargo, and you're in a very interesting city, New Orleans. Did you have a chance to explore uh, when you had time off? <laughs> uh, this, I guess I'll have to tell it. <laughs> You know, the first pass in town, you know. Uh, in New Orleans, they had what they called corn, corn whiskey. And uh, we was gonna, everybody got a half pint of whiskey. And I, I never drank whiskey before, so that was to move to me. But anyway, I, I got in the car with the group, and they was passing the bottle around. You know, just had a pint bottle of corn liquor. And that, I found out later that was the strongest stuff in the world. <laughs> I, I, it tastes good, you know. So I took a swallow, it passed back around, I'd take another. And by the time we got to town, which was 25 miles away, I was too drunk to get out of the car. <laughs> it had to take me back to camp, put me to bed. It's like, I was 18 years old, I never drank anything before, so it was different. Well, at least it wasn't anything worse. <laughs> no. That was so much for your first New Orleans adventure. Yeah, that was my first New Orleans adventure. Now, um, how long was basic? And um, how long were you stationed in, New, uh, in uh, New Orleans? Six months. And what happened after New Orleans? We went to Manchester, England.
that went over on, uh, we went over on the Queen Mary, the largest luxury ship, but it wasn't a luxury ship then. They had taken out all of the luxury things and it just had uh, hammocks, hammocks, you know, and we slept in those in a tier, you know, before from people. How long did it take you to cross the Atlantic? 14 days. That's not bad. No, considering that they, they'd only go one direction for 12 minutes, 14 minutes, and then they'd take another direction because they was uh, zigzagging, you know, to keep the submarines from getting a beat on them. Uh, was the Queen Mary alone or was it part of a convoy? No, it was alone. And so was the Queen Elizabeth. Those were the luxury ships you know, of the English country. And do you remember uh, whether the Queen Mary was just kind of full of people? It was full of soldiers. Full of soldiers. There was no, no passengers on there. It was all soldiers and they had it set up so they had a, where you ate, had a bench like this, only it was a trough, you know, the trough is. And uh, you'd get your tray, you know, food, mess kit and you come and you sit it on this tray, on this tray here and there's a, the trough was back there so guys that been, hadn't been on the ship before was getting sick, you know, and they threw up and they'd be right. <laughs> so I, I, I never allowed myself to get sick. I, they were the guys next to me been going, <laughs> I said, I'm, I, I'm not gonna take that into myself. So I ate my food. I did it all right too. I never did get seasick. Now, on the Queen Mary, were you just a passenger? Uh, at least all the way, like more like a stowaway. <laughs> uh, they took out all the luxury stuff, you know. We didn't have no beds and things. They had hammocks, so we could be a five tier high, you know, of people sleeping on top on on each one. It's all made out of canvas, you know. So it, they, just, they could turn it into a troop carrying ship. Yeah. And while you were on the Queen Mary, uh, were you segregated? We were segregated all my time in the Army. See, there was, we had all black people in the service at that point. It was in a different regiment, different company, different battalion. But the, all the officers were white. So the highest rank a black person could get in the army it was in would be a master sergeant or first sergeant. They couldn't get any bars, you know, lieutenant, captain, colonel, that wouldn't work. All right, Emerson, we now got you, have you in Manchester, England. Uh, what was your rank? I was a technician, fourth grade. <clears throat> Excuse me, technician, fourth grade. Which equals uh, corporal? But, it equals a buck sergeant, buck sergeant. three okay. stripe sergeant. Yeah. And what unit were? <clears throat> excuse me. What unit were you with? I was with the 494th Port Battalion, Company 241. Twenty first. Okay. And um, when did you land in England? If you were six just, months. Yeah. Six months after, I was inducted into the army. I was in England. So you were um, maybe late 43, early 44? Yeah. I, I, it's probably on the, my papers there. I don't, I don't remember the exact date, but it was six months later. Well, we ended in 43. So it would have been September, like that, that year, I think. You're now in Manchester. Uh, what, did, what were you doing once you got to Manchester? We unloaded ships and loaded cargo, and we worked on the docks with the English. The English guys would uh, they have their ritual of 10 o'clock, they would stop everything and have tea and crumpets. And then that would last for 30 minutes, then they'd go back. We would, two o'clock, they'd stop everything and have tea and crumpets. And they did that all through the wall. You know, we, we couldn't do that. We had to keep working, you know, but they, they did never stop change their the way of work. Aside from the tea and crumpets, what was it like working with the English? 
it was good. They were, they were nice, you know, really, really, they treated us like real people, you know. We was an all black uh, outfit, and I don't think they had many black people in England either at that time. Of course, I didn't see any in the army. And how long were you stationed in Manchester? Until mm, the invasion, which went, went over in September. So the invasion was uh, June, June, let me see. 6th of June, 1944. Yes, 6th of June, 1944. Now, leading up to it, and I'm sure that they were trying to keep everything very hush-hush, mm -hmm. but did you or any other member of your unit kind of notice something different as the months were coming on and you're seeing all this equipment? Oh, yes. We knew we was unloading every guns and mm -hmm. shells and soldiers, more soldiers over there. So we knew what was coming. And when did you find out that you were going to be part of the invasion fleet? Hmm. Well, from the day we got there, we had an assembly of uh, everybody came out, you know, and this was uh, the captain, he was from Arkansas. He, he talked to us about it. And first thing he told us though that uh, there was no black girls in England. He says, uh, you'll, be, be, you'll be around white girls, he said. But you got to remember, when you go back to the States, you can't do that no more. You don't mess with white women. <laughs> so, we, we all just fell out laughing at him. <laughs> we figured, he's gone too far now, you know, forget this. Right. No one paid it any attention. So just to clarify, you folks knew that there was going to be an invasion taking place oh, yes. before right. just about anybody else. Yes, we didn't know the exact date, though. Mm -hmm. See. He, even I didn't tell anybody the exact date until it happened. Which the invasion, I found out later, was supposed to start on the 5th of June, but it had a storm in the channel, and it's, it delayed it until the 6th. Yeah. When you were in Manchester, how did you uh, keep posted on war news, what was happening yeah. on the other fronts? Stars and Stripes. That was a newspaper. That was published by the Army, for the Army, and of the Army. <laughs> and uh, did you have any time off when you were in Manchester? Yes, I could get a pass to go in, in the evening. That's where I learned to drink bitters. They, they would uh, have, <laughs> every night, they would sing Hail to the Queen. Oh, and and uh, you didn't join in with them. They, the English guy, soldiers would challenge you, you know, oh, why, <laughs> why are you not singing? So I would break out in song too. I, I didn't want to have to fight with the English. We had the Germans it was enough. Perfectly logical, yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Emerson, leading up to the 5th to the 6th of June, did you know that you were going to be going over there? Yeah, we knew we was going over. We didn't know when. Okay. Yeah, we knew it was going. Over. Yeah. And do you remember uh, what ship were you on when you were going to Normandy? To Normandy. Yeah. I was on a, a cargo ship. Okay. Do you know the it, name of it? They didn't have names. They were just steel ships that okay. uh, made for cargo across the channel. Mm -hmm. And what were you told? about the impending invasion, that there was going to be stiff resistance and what have you? They didn't tell us anything until the night before they, okay. we left. <clears throat> the sergeant called assembly and said in the morning we're leaving for Normandy. The invasion is starting. But it didn't start the next day because of the storm. So, But we knew where we were going. Okay. Yeah. Now, Emerson, um, Let's pause you right before you hit Normandy. Um, you mentioned that you had uh, some brothers and sisters. Did mm -hmm. any of them join the military? I'm, my brother, Your brother, one of my brothers did. Okay. David, he was in the 92nd Infantry Division, which was uh, all military outfit, and they fought in, in Italy. And it was all black unit. I was the only one in the Army. 
And did David make out, make out okay? Yeah, he was missing for three weeks, but later he told us that they were just hiding out in the homes of some Italian families to get away from the war. At least he got out okay. Yeah, he came home all right, yeah. Uh, and uh, were you uh, sending letters back home, and did you receive letters? Oh, my mother. My mother wrote me every week. I, I depended on that. I was never afraid when I was in the Army. I was never afraid that I was going to get killed or going to get hurt or anything. And my mother sent me letters every week saying she was praying for me. And all. She was very special and religious. And I believed her. I didn't think anything would happen. <laughs> and it didn't. Well, let's get you to Normandy then. <laughs> Tell us what... Tell us what Normandy was like when you guys got there. <laughs> oh, you didn't, I didn't see the, the banks. I was on a cargo ship. Mm -hmm. I was out in, in the channel until the morning of the uh, invasion. Then we moved in closer, and we unloaded the first guns and the first soldiers to try to get into Normandy. The Germans had a whole embankment of Normandy filled with 88 cannons. So the first wave, which was 40,000 men or more, were just slaughtered. Because the LSTs couldn't get in close enough that the people could use their rifles to fight back. They had to wait in water and get a rifle up over their heads like this, because they, they couldn't shoot. They couldn't shoot back. So they backed off soldiers from going in, and they called in the P-38 airplanes, which was our best fighters at that time, and strafed the whole hill and blew up the embankment that they had there. That was a terrible one. And did you see all of this? Mm-hmm. I, I, I need a second, excuse me. Okay. I don't like to go back there. <laughs> okay, I'm ready whenever you are. Okay. Okay. So you're there at the invasion, you're unloading cargo. Mm -hmm. Were the Germans firing at your ship? Yes, they were firing at all the ships out there. I was very lucky. Not only that, they were strafing the ship with the airplanes flying over. And I was a winch operator, which meant I'd sit on the deck and pull up. I don't know if you know what a winch is. The, I do. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's a machine that they have to pull the cargo up out of the hole and send it over to the side and unload it onto the shore. So. My job was to run the winch. There was two of us. One would be in the center of the hole of the ship where the cargo was. He would pull it up to a height where it would go over the side of the ship. And the second guy would be over here would be the one that would swing it and let it down to the people waiting on it, down at the boat, or LST, or whether it was soldiers, whatever. And I had the outside winch. And my buddy had the inside, and we had a thing we'd say, you know, and I'd say, shake a head, Bo, and he'd, he'd bring it up, and uh, I'd catch it. You have to catch it just right, and, or you lose the whole pallet. So we'd catch it and carry it over, and I was the one who let it down on the side. The first pallet I let down was one of the soldiers would squish you with the, battle, with the pallet, but uh, they told me that. This is war, don't think about it, you know. <laughs> Woo, so you had bullets flying all over the place. Yeah, the, German, the Germans didn't have much of an air force left at that point, you know, because uh, I guess they'd been fighting Poland and they'd been bombed by the United States for months, you know. But what they had, I was sitting on the, on the deck running the winch and the Germans was flying over you know, and strafing the ship, and the bullets was hitting the, the, the steel ship. It sounded just like popcorn popping, you know. And I never received any injuries. 
That's amazing. Yeah. There was, we had these uh, cables, metal cables tied to balloons that was up to keep the planes from coming low, too low, you know, so that was wore them off. And one night I was working there and uh, the balloon was tied to the right near the winch of the ship, which is all steel, it's all, everything is steel, <laughs> metal, you know. So this balloon with the cable on it was tied right by my winch. And the lightning, it rained that night and the lightning hit the balloon and I could see the streak of lightning come down this wire cable and the drum, this, these winches had these big metal drums and it went, the fire was just going around and around that drum and I'm looking at it, you know, it just, it, and I got over to a metal handle, which is all part of that, and I didn't feel a thing. The guys, the guys on the ship, they, they thought I was dead because they saw the lightning strike that winch and they said, no way, you go, he's going to survive that. But somebody was looking at, I gave my mother credit for it. It's, it's, it must have been her prayers that saved me because it wasn't physically possible. Hmm. Uh, during the time you were operating a winch, uh, did you at least wear some kind of protection like a helmet or jacket? Yeah, yeah, we had a helmet on, but no jacket. And did the cargo ship have any kind of guns? to at least kind of war, aside from the cable and balloons, such as something to ward off the uh, the aircraft? No, they didn't have guns. They had, uh, what do you call them, battleships. Okay. Surrounding our, our ships, which were supposed to fight off the Germans, you know, but they, they couldn't keep everybody out. And how long uh, were you offloading cargo in Normandy? until Patton got to bombs Germany. <laughs> we followed it. We was Patton supply unit. And after we had enough supplies on the ship, I mean, on the shore, then we would go out and get trucks and they would, that's how the Red Ball started. And carry Patton's gasoline, bullets, whatever he needed, you know. And we would we'd put stacks of uh, cannon shells out in the woods in France. And one night we were, we had a stack of uh, cannons waiting to be sent up by the red ball trucks. And uh, one German plane came flying over and he dropped a flare. You know, and those flares, was, it looked just like broad daylight, you know, this was at night, you know. So that was, 15 people in my squad, we had a stack of uh, cannons, uh, shells, and all kinds of things stacked up 10 feet high. So the German plane come, flew over, he dropped his flare, and it just lit up just like daylight. You know? So we, we made a pact, though. it was 15 of us, that if, if he came back and bombed us, if we, we heard him go around, if he makes a turn and get, get back in, we just gonna get under the, the shells, and it'll, <laughs> cause we couldn't escape anyway. Once he hit that, we go. We just said we're gonna we go all go out all at once together. But when he when this plane made the turn, and as he made the turn, I didn't know this at the time. None of us did. There was an anti-Africa gun, just like the one out here, It hit that guy just as he made his turn and blew him up. And we, we, was, we all were thankful that night. And do you remember where that uh, incident took place? Was it in France? It was in, in France, in yes. France. That's where we unloaded it. You mentioned that you were the supply unit for General Patton. Did you ever meet him? Not personally. I saw him. I'd been in groups where he came by. You know, he, he's a tough guy. <laughs> he won't for white fortifiers on each hip, if you. Here's some. Okay, the, okay go ahead. <laughs> I don't know, that's, people said that that was, there was something funny about him getting killed right after the war was over, you know. That they, there's all kind of rumors about that, but who knows. Okay. Well, let's get you back to France and mm -hmm. part of the supply unit 
Tell us what happened uh, next. Well, we, we followed Pat all the way to Bonn in Germany with, with the supplies, with our supplies in the unit. And by the time you got to Bonn in Germany, then the war was done. Now, Emerson, uh, of course, along the way, there was a little thing called the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, were you involved in that? Oh, <laughs> this is good. <laughs> it was two weeks. Patton was bogged out because this has been put into a movie, but I was there. <laughs> And uh, it was two weeks of rain and mud, and Patton had all of his uh, ministers, they don't call them ministers in the army anyway, the guys that were supposed to be uh, soul savers. Oh, chaplains. Uh, chaplains, I say, yeah. Uh, he had all of them to write a memo to God to stop the rain. And two weeks <laughs> it had been raining. It did stop. <laughs> I had to give Pat credit for that. But in the meantime, when they were bogged down there for those two weeks, they was asking for volunteers to come up to for fight, and they were getting people out of the uh, work units. You know. That's where they said blacks didn't fight in the infantry over there, but they did. A lot of the guys volunteered and went up. And they, he was accepted. Whether you were black, green, or gray, he wanted people. And, Patton had blacks in the army that fighting right along with the whites, all during the balls and after that too, all the, way, all the way to Germany. But that kind of news never got out, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, what about your personal experiences at that period? I was, I was, I stayed with what I was doing. I you'd tell the guys, you know, and they were saying they could volunteer and go up there, you know. I said. I said, my mother told me, she said, don't volunteer for anything, even if it's a Salvation Army and they're passing out biscuits. <laughs> don't volunteer. I didn't volunteer for anything. So you continued with uh, cargo? Oh, yes, yes. All right, and you're, just, you're heading through Europe, got all the bulge mm -hmm. taken care of, and you're, actually, you're now on German soil. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us what that whole period was like. Just you're, you're heading into enemy territory. Yeah, that, that, you know, I, I didn't feel it like, you're never alone, you know what I mean? You, you're surrounded by people, you're surrounded by your buddies, you're surrounded by the machinery, the guns and everything. So you, you, have, you have confidence that they're going to take care of it. We've been pushing them all the way across France, you know, and we're going to take them to, get them to Germany. Mm -hmm. so. Now, I uh, just wanted to get a couple mentions about the equipment. Uh, do you remember what kind of truck was being used for uh, shipments? They were what they call half-ton trucks. They were, uh, General Motors, I think, made them then. Probably still do, I don't know. And while you were heading across Europe, uh, even though you were doing cargo, did you have your rifle or other weapons available? Oh, yes. Okay. Of course, we, we were only issued carbines. People didn't work units. They only received carbines, which, which is a small rifle. Uh, the regular army rifle was O3, which is a big gun that shot, held a lot more bullets. And Emerson, when uh, when you guys kind of paused to take meals, were uh, did you have K, K rations or did you have hot oh, meals? Oh yes, that was K rations. It was a big chocolate candy bar, about that long, and had three three different pieces to it. You know where you could break it in two, and each one you could just eat that quarter that <laughs> and drink water. And you would feel like you was had a full meal, and so so you have a big uh, chocolate bar a day, and you had it made. And while you were heading across France, did you, did you um did you or any of the unit have any time off, or was it just push push push? No, well, we, well after into France we did have some time off. We could go if France when France was cleared, we could go to. Uh, town to pubs and stuff. It had, we get off, off campus passes. Was the war was just about over then. 
and I had quite an experience set up. Uh, I was always, after things quieted down and we could get passes, I'd always go off by myself. I wouldn't stay with the group, you know. I, I'd like to sort of explore. So one night I went uh, to this a saloon, and there was about six, seven uh, American soldiers in there. No one else was in the saloon. But the woman, about a 70-year-old woman, they were slapping her around. And uh, I, I walked in. I, I'm by myself, you know, and these are about five, six guys. They must have been from the south or somewhere because they had an awful wing, you know. And I said, so what have we here, you know? I said, man, I said, we're Americans. We came here to save these people. We didn't come over here to slap it around. I said, that's what the Germans did. We're Americans. We don't do that, you know. And I said, uh, I realize, you know, you've been had a few drinks and you, you're feeling different, but we, we don't want to have that reputation like the Germans had, you know. And they said, oh, oh okay, buddy, we'll leave. And it, it shamed them so that I think it shocked them too, you know. These are all white guys. Uh, and I'm the only black in there. And he, they go out the door. As soon as they get out the door, uh, this woman's daughter who owned the bar, you know, put this big uh, board down so they couldn't get back in. So then she took me and took me down into the tunnels where they used to hide from the Germans, you know. Well, about uh, five minutes, ten minutes later, you know, they got outside and they, they thought, who got them out of there, and who, why did they do that? <laughs> they came back and started shooting up the place, you know. Oh man! But I was, I was, I wasn't in the saloon anymore. She, she, this woman knew what was going to happen, you know. So she took me down in the town, and they were just shooting and cussing and calling me all kinds of names, you know. And it, it was, I stayed down there all night. But they finally left about after 45 minutes or so. It couldn't get in anymore. What was the adventures? I'll say. Mm -hmm. All right, we're uh, heading toward the end of the war now. Mm -hmm. You know, in Ger uh, I trust uh, Bonn, Germany, wasn't it? Yes, Bonn. Yeah. Okay. But after after when the war ended, we were sent back to England. Uh, so tell me a little bit about uh, when the war ended in Bonn, Germany. Uh, did you did you say, hey, the Germans surrendered? <laughs> uh, I, they was bummed, so I don't think there was enough of them left <laughs> to surrender. But the one was that they brought back to our camps in the work these work battalion camps. They bring the German soldiers there, and they were happy to get out of the army, you know. They, they didn't want to fight anymore either. So they was, they was around and I, we, we had them washing dishes and cleaning <laughs> kitchens and everything as the war prisoners, yeah. And they were happy. Yeah, they were happy, yeah. So let's bring ourselves to May 1945. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, um, do you remember hearing about uh, the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt, which took place oh, in April. Oh yes, yes, yes. That was a sad time for us. That was that was before the invasion, and he died. Yeah. And Truman took over. You know, so we everybody was concerned. You know, we had a newspaper called Stars and Stripes, yep. mm -hmm. and uh, they published everything that was going on. You know, if you could get one. You could find out, but there wasn't enough to go around, you know, so you'd go from company to company trying to find right. a copy of this paper. But we found out that Roosevelt died. That was a sad day for everyone. Mm -hmm. but and when uh, when BE Day took place, was there a celebration? Oh, yes. We came back to France, and did we have a celebration? The, the, the square, the Everybody was out in the square, all the people saying, uh, in le fair, what is it? In le fair, I think. Anyway, there was a the end of the war in, in, uh, in French. But 
we had, that was a good time. They was giving away free wine and Calvados and <laughs> everything. Everybody was happy and joyful. That was a great day. You, know, you just mentioned that Warren's, you're back, you guys are back in England. Mm -hmm. Were you going to go to Japan? Yes. We were in camp to go to Japan. They was giving us shots, giving us instructions what to do when they get to, to Japan. And that's when they dropped the first atom bomb. And we didn't have to go to France. We didn't have to go to Japan. What, uh, what did you do when you heard that this thing called an atom bomb had just been detonated in Japan? Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> we, we didn't want to go to Japan. That's for sure. We had been fighting this war here, and it was in, and then they're going to send us over there. We, we was in camp 45 days. So now that the A-bombs were dropped, Japan would surrender uh, shortly thereafter. Were you still in England, or hey, you had points, you can go back home. <laughs> yeah, I was, we was in England, but mm -hmm. we didn't get to come back home right away. We, we were the last group to come back. You see, this was the days in segregated armies. And most white troops came back, and we were there five months after the war ended before we were brought back. Uh, were you still doing cargo duty or just kind of going like this? Though, to the <laughs> no, <laughs> we were doing cargo duty. Of course, the Army can always find something for you to do, you know. Like they say, come out, we're going to police the place, you know. So you go out thinking you're going to go out and corral some people, you know. And what they mean, they want you to clean up the trash around the camp. <laughs> so <laughs> they kept you busy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Emerson, we now have you five months after the war and you get news that your unit's going home. Uh, what rank were you at the time? Are you still a sergeant? Yeah, technician, fourth grade. Okay, still a tech four. And when did you uh, get back home? I got back home five months after the war ended. So let's see, May, about October, uh, September, October, 1945? Yeah. yeah. And where were you? Uh, where did you land in the United States? In New York. In New York, okay. <clears throat> but they sent us back to our home state to be discharged. So back to Arkansas? Yes. I had to go back. And then uh, were you going back to Kansas to see your family? No, I didn't have a family then. My father was dead. Yeah. My mother was still alive, uh -huh. but I didn't have. I, you mean personal family? Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. like your uh, siblings. Were you going oh. back to Topeka? Yeah, I went back to Topeka. Oh, okay. My mother was still living. I was thinking of a personal family. Oh no, no, no that's all right. <laughs> and uh, let's see. And what kind of um, did you receive any medals, commendations for your service? Yeah, at the. Uh, Bronze Star, and uh, I can't remember the others, but it's on my discharge papers yeah. what I had. Yeah, I saw uh, you got the ribbon with two battle stars. Excuse me? The, uh, the two battle stars and the bronze ribbon? No, it's not that. It's a ribbon, and then the uh -huh. uh, stars of bronze. Okay. Yeah, two stars. Oh, and the bronze arrowhead. Yeah, arrowhead, that's mm -hmm. right, yes. And what was that for? Uh, well, for ETO, the European Theater of Operations, mm -hmm. you know, you, you would get it. the ribbon indicated you did that, and the bronze star was what you, how many battles you were in. The battle stars, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the arrowhead was for what? Same thing, I guess. Okay. We, mm -hmm. After the war, did you join any service organizations like the VFW or the Legion? No, I didn't. I started VFW for a long time after. But I did. I became a life member for, in the VFW, and I'm okay. still up in post now, H772 in Boston. And 
And Emerson, did you, uh, you said after the war, you went back to trade school. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, because I didn't get to finish high school. Okay. Yeah. And trade school, you, you could get, well, they gave us $300 mustering out pay you know, when we came out. And, uh, and free school and to finish your, I, was, I, I could have went on to college and took a whole different field. If I'd have been smart, then <laughs> you learn. Uh, I took, I, I started doing auto mechanics and that didn't work for me. That, that wasn't my field. I was, I was a people person and I didn't realize it until later. So what did you do for work after the war, besides go to trade school? Yeah, well, my brother, Aaron, was in, living in Detroit at that time. So uh, he, he met me in Topeka, and I went back there with him. And then we went to Arkansas. I, have a, I had a brother in Arkansas, and uh, he, was, he was a f farmer, so he wanted me to stay with him, you know. So. I stayed a couple of weeks, but my other brother, Aaron, he was in uh, Detroit working in uh, building packet cars. I don't think they make those anymore. <laughs> so he asked me to come to, back to Detroit with him, and that's what I did. But in meanwhile, I met my wife when I was in Arkansas. And what was her name? Her name was Nina. I called her Nina. Her name was Evelyn. <laughs> She's deceased now. Okay. So now you're in Detroit mm -hmm. with your brother Aaron. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he uh, were you making Packards along with him? Mm-hmm. Tell us what happened next. They went on a strike. Uh oh. And <laughs> they got I got a for what a way to, what they wanted as a raise. And then the company shut down. So for two weeks, three weeks, I didn't have any, we didn't have any income. So my brother, who had been living there, decided we should go back to the Pika. So meanwhile, I had gotten married then, and uh, my wife, we got on the train to go back to the Pika. And I, I, I came down with appendix, appendicitis, mm -hmm. and boy, it was painful. So when we reached Topeka, they took me directly to the VA hospital. And the doctor said if it had been another hour and a half, they would have burst and I wouldn't be here. You know? mm -hmm. so, but I, still, I was in the hospital for 30 days for appendix, which was unheard of <laughs> even then. But I developed an infection on the incision. But those days, all they had at the VA was interns, you know. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't dismiss me because I was running a temp every day. Finally, the, uh, the chief surgeon or somebody came by and looked at what, why I was in there for 30 days for appendix operation. And he saw this lump on where the infection was, you know. And he says, that's what's keeping his temp up, you know. So he just opened it up right there. Because uh, he said it was dead, and it did. I didn't feel a thing anyway. But uh, cleaned it out, and I was gone by the hospital for the next three weeks or so. But while I was in the hospital, I met a lot of my friends who was over, went overseas with me. And they were working there as, as aides, psychiatric aides which was, uh, there was a lot of uh, people coming back from the war, you know, that soldiers that had to be hospitalized. So they had, I signed up before I was able to get out of the hospital to work there. So I, I started working at the VA and uh, I worked the rest of the time from VA. Then I, the state hospital was Part of it. This is Carl Minninger's days. Uh, you know, if you've heard of Carl, he was the first one who tried, who changed the way that they treated mentally ill patients. And I went to the uh, state hospital, worked for them, then I worked for the VA. And then I was working two jobs. I had 
by then I was married and uh, seemed like he was having children every two weeks, but it wasn't quite that <laughs> But I had to take on two jobs to stay ahead of things. What you're describing is actually quite interesting that you were, you were actually trying to help those who were in the war along oh, with Oh, that, that, that was the whole idea, you know. And that's what Carl Meninger said. He had an orientation class, you know, Carl, and he said, if you can't love, I want you to get up and go out of the room now. Because these people need love and care. If you're not willing to do that, I don't want you to be in the class. So no one left, you know. But he was, he was turning that treatment of mental health people around. Because at the state hospital, they still had people in cages where they just take a hose and wash them down, you know. So I started working at the VA hospital. And then as the children kept coming, I, I started working at uh, state also. So I worked two jobs, eight hour jobs for 15 years straight. And this uh, is uh, in Kansas, right? In Topeka, in yes. Topeka, okay. Mm -hmm. Two jobs for 15 years, wow. <laughs> and I, I, on the two jobs, I was <laughs> making $300 a month at the state, $400 a month at the VA. And that was my total salary for two jobs, which would kept bread on the table, you know. Yeah. So, Emerson, uh, what were your duties being an aide, a psychiatric aide? Well, in those days, they was treating uh, patients with uh, water therapy. They put them in cold packs. So I did, I put help put them in cold packs. We worked with a group, you know, there'd be about four or five men on the unit, you know. You had to because fights was breaking out all the time. Some of these guys was stoned out of the mind, you know, and they had all kinds of delusions. You know. And uh, I, one of my friends, his, his, his buddy Bugs, he's deceased now, but uh, one of the patients thought he was their, his, his chauffeur. So we went to, <laughs> to go down and get his Cadillac out and bring it up there. He wanted to leave. You know. So uh, it, it, was, it was so many funny things happening. You know. it, it, but it wasn't funny then. But I know that was those two patients who slept side by side, and both of them thought they were God. And, and he would say, this one would say he was God, and this one over here would say, you're a goddamn lawyer, I'm God. You know, I'm not a liar, you know what I'm It was a tough time. Yeah. Did you continue working in the mental health field? That was my niche. That was your niche. Yeah. So how did you end up in Massachusetts? Well, that's another niche. <laughs> I uh, organized a union in Kansas. After, just as long after my uh, army and working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Kansas have a right to work law, so they didn't allow unions. But I met a young psychiatrist named Bill Bronston from New York who came down there to go through the mini psychiatric training. And uh, he saw how we was working. We were, the AIDS was doing everything, you know. They was giving the medication, they was restraining the patients, and so the nurses was just supervising. So he said, you guys don't know what you're worth, you know. You, you should get more money and get recognition. And we was taking college courses, but we couldn't get it record, recorded on our record or recognition for it in, in the hospitals. So uh, he, called, he called a strike. But we didn't leave the patient. We called it in, inpatient strike. We took care of the patient, but we didn't respect the authority. We worked with the patients, and they were the, the, 
managing staff, you know, they, they called to, to serve the police, <laughs> oh, yeah. but they couldn't, they were not ready to what to quit their arrest us for. We were doing our job, you know, we were taking care of the patient, that's why we was out there. You know? So that lasted for 40 days, but we, we finally received all our things that we were asking for. And I received my black ball that I couldn't find a job anywhere in Kansas anymore. That was it. So you came up here? I came up here. How, how did you uh, find out there was a job in Massachusetts with your I'm, name on it? That was a psychiatrist mm -hmm. uh, who had a brother who lived in Massachusetts. And he, he asked, I asked him, you know, to influence to help me get a job, I go to Massachusetts. So they sent for me, and I went, came here, and I was in such frustrated state at that point. So I, I had to stay off to work altogether for about three weeks, and this doctor put me up at Children's Hospital, and I was I was in there for two weeks, just just pulling it together again, you know. And, they gave me no mental diagnosis, so I thought maybe that was a good thing. Now, overall, uh, did you feel that the VA uh, gave you adequate care, both when the appendicitis and later on when you were in the mental health field? Yeah, well, for the time. I, you know, I, I don't think they were just deliberately prejudiced against me black patient there. I think this young intern just didn't know what to do. You know. and I'm glad that he did call his boss and checked it out. So they, and when did you move to Massachusetts? Uh, 1968. That year? Wow. <laughs> yeah, so that, yeah, that's what... Yeah. <laughs> You're in the middle of downtown civil rights movement. Yeah. <laughs> That's what got me out of Kansas. <laughs> wow. So here you are in the middle, in the middle of Yankee land. Mm -hmm. uh, you just spent two weeks in Children's Hospital. Did you eventually uh, find work? Oh, yes. 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 I, when I came here, I worked at Boston State Hospital for mm -hmm. years. And then I took on another job at the Harvard Street Neighborhood Health Center, which is an all black uh, center. It's still in existence. So now you're at, you're actually in during a very very turbulent time, of course, the civil rights movement. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was scared to death. I was I was afraid that uh, Martin Luther King was going to get killed. Uh, when Rosa Parks said, didn't give up a seat on the bus, I was afraid she was going to get killed. But when Martin Luther King started talking about Nonviolence, you know, and uh, the right thing to do. Yeah, I, I, I latched on to him in politics. And you've remained in Massachusetts to this day. Yes. Yes. And uh, Emerson, do you have any other uh, stories about your experiences during the Second World War? Do, uh, do you remember any um, any buddies in particular? Excuse me? Do you remember any of your friends? Oh, yes, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, being in a work outfit, you don't, they, they weren't on the front lines, you know. They, they, most of them would be by accident or by cargo, uh, mishandled, or, or they get shot by Germans flying over, you know. Cause, we couldn't, you can't shoot back and work, you know, yet. <laughs> I thought we'd have been able to penetrate a plane anyway with our little uh, carbines. But I had, I had one real good friend to get killed, like, oh. by strafing, you know. Okay. Now, Emerson, of course, we're doing this interview here at the Museum of World War II Boston, and of course, we're surrounded by some incredible exhibits. Um, any words about the museum itself? I think they did a good job of pulling it together, you know? I really do. I'm impressed, especially with a tank. 
So when we was out, I was out here the first time, uh, somebody in that group says, how did they get that tank in here? <laughs> I said, they built the building around the tank. <laughs> that's how they did it. <laughs> the person here said, yeah, that's how they did it. Did they really do it that way? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> But I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure they're figuring and even now they're figuring out a way because there are plans to expand the museum. Really? Oh, that's mm -hmm. a good thing. So well, Emerson, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap things up? Uh, how important was it for you to serve in the military? I became a man. I was, that's, that's what I can say. I'm a man. Yeah, I, I was. Uh, you know, the prejudice thing didn't bother me much, you know, because we were all one group, and all the blacks were together, and all the whites were together. You know, when we first landed in uh, England, the lieutenant uh, captain from—he was from Arkansas. He was white. You know, I told you all the officers were white. You know. So he called a general assembly, had it all lined up in the boat, and he says, "Now, you boys, they don't find no black girls here." He said. But uh, don't think that you can go with white girls when you get back to the States. That's over. Don't mm -hmm. think about it. <laughs> we just all fell out laughing. You know, it, it broke rank. <laughs> it was so important to him. Yeah. Emerson, is there anything else? <sighs> hmm. Well, I think, you know, when, when I went in the Army, I went right out of school into the Army. And I think the Army made me a, a different person than I probably would, would have been if I had stayed here. Uh, the experience of meeting another country, meeting another different race of people, it was, uh, I think it was a growing up and a great lesson for me to, to do that. And when I came back to the States, I had a whole t different view that I knew that, uh, see, when I was raised in Arkansas, you know, you were taught that uh, white people were better and you stay in your place. But I found out that was different. And when I came back, you know, I didn't respect that rule anymore. I, I could be anybody I want to be with be my own person. And with that, Emerson Stamps, we thank you so much for coming to the Museum of World War II Boston and recording this interview for the Natick Veterans Oral History Project.